written a book called The Satanic Bible. It's about accepting both evil and good. Many bands throughout the 80s used a variety of theatrics and imagery to shock and entertain their audience to stand out from the crowd. Slayer, Judas Priest and even Kiss all tried to either look or sound like something that would haunt your dreams. In 1981 though, a Danish heavy metal band would take it one step further by not just including demonic imagery and lyrics into their act, but some say they even worshipped Satan himself. They would become one of the most controversial metal bands of the 1980s, as well as the focal point of a modern day witch hunt carried out by the US government under the guise of the PMRC. They would also be noted as one of the first wave of black metal bands aside Venom and Bathory, and heavily influenced the future of the black metal genre. During the 80s, they would only release two records, Melissa in 1983 and Don't Break the Oath in 1984, both of which featured satanic themes and lyrics about the occult and witchcraft along with what would be considered at the time to be powerfully disturbing anti-religious artwork. Singer King Diamond would even forge a friendship with the founder of the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey. Well, we don't feel that fear is necessary to base a religion on. And over the years relied heavily on the teachings of the Satanic Bible, of which he considered to be a philosophy to live by. Their use of inverted crosses, skulls, devilish iconography, and the now infamous and morbidly named corpse paint made them one of the most feared and recognizable music groups we've ever witnessed. This is Into the Coven, the merciful fate story. I give the devil benefit of law for my own safety's sake. In 1971, Kim Peterson, better known as King Diamond to you and me, would buy his first three vinyl records, Deep Purple's Fireball, Black Sabbath's Master of Reality, and Jethro Tull's Aqualung. Born in Copenhagen, Denmark in 1956, he was around 15 when he discovered these early influences. He would listen to rock programs on a small cassette radio that blasted Sabbath's Paranoid and Deep Purple's In Rock, amongst others, opening his eyes and ears to the world of rock and heavy metal. Although Sabbath had often been labelled as a band of the occult, King Diamond had already found his love for horror and things that go bump in the night, thanks to his parents allowing him to watch some early scary movies and TV shows. My parents would let me watch it, back when there was only black and white TV. Maybe when I was 10 or 12 years old. I would sit up and watch Frankenstein, Dracula and all those old classic horror movies. Then I remember when the door was not completely closed at night, I was sure they would come up from under my bed. His favourite horror film of all time though would become The Shining, a film directed by Stanley Kubrick in 1980 based on Stephen King's 1977 horror novel. Diamond says he was also fascinated by the original Adams Family show that first aired in 1964, a popular TV series that followed a spooky, fictional American household with a love for quirky yet macabre interests, with the most modern conception of this being the recent Netflix series Wednesday. That wasn't Diamond's only source of morbid inspiration though. Whilst he would take some cues from Alice Cooper, as a child he would often suffer from night terrors which most likely came from stories his father told him from the war. My dad was a freedom fighter in Denmark against the occupational forces, the SS and the Gestapo. He told me stories but I sometimes wonder if I could have been there myself because the nightmares are so vivid and clear, and it's always exactly the same. Before becoming a corpse-painted singer though, he first tried his hand at being a guitar player after hearing Led Zeppelin in 1969. 
this is what gave him the idea of becoming a musician in the first place. The urge to create sound myself came mainly from Jimmy Page's guitar. I got the first Led Zeppelin album and I was like, man, I would love to create that raw guitar sound. So I saved up again and got my first guitar, which was a lousy copy of an Explorer. When I got it home, I was surprised that it didn't sound like Jimmy Page. A family friend told me that I needed an amp. After a family friend built him his own guitar amp, he would take it to the local library of all places where they had small rehearsal rooms and try to recreate the now classic Jimmy Page sound, which as we all know, definitely isn't the musical path that he would end up following. Soon after, he would join his first band, Brainstorm, where he actually played guitar and didn't sing at all. He'd not yet even considered becoming a singer or the iconic frontman we see before us today until he joined Black Rose. I was thrown into being a singer because the band I played guitar in stopped, and then I was looking for another band to play guitar in, and I saw this ad in a supermarket. A band looking for a singer that was playing Deep Purple style. I had never sang in my life. Black Rose would be that band. They asked him to sing Space Truckin' by Deep Purple, which would be the first song King Diamond ever auditioned with for a band as a singer. They rehearsed for several hours and Diamond left without a voice. He spent the entire audition just trying to scream and had wrecked his vocal cords. Diamond eventually learned how to control his voice with breathing techniques, which led him to develop the now very recognizable falsetto tone we hear today. Neither Brainstorm nor Black Rose amounted to anything, and King would soon find himself in a band with guitarist Hank Sherman. This band was called Bratz, more hard rock mixed with punk than anything else. King Diamond would replace their singer, Jens Leonhard, but this band wouldn't last long either as King and Hank decided to renounce the commercial path the record label wanted Bratz to follow and started their own group, a group more suited to their beliefs and destiny. That group would be known as Merciful Fate. Merciful Fate would officially form in 1981. After a couple of lineup changes, the members would be King Diamond, Hank Sherman, Michael Denner, Timmy Hansen, and Kim Ruz. This lineup would span the first era of the band up until 1985. Satanism would play a big part of the band's image and philosophy right from the start. It's not exactly clear when King Diamond first got his hands on the Satanic Bible, but he states that he lived by its teachings long before reading it. There is a book written by uh, a guy called Anton Santalave who lives in San Francisco. Uh, in 1966, he uh, came up with the first real established Satanic Church in America, and uh, he's written a book called The Satanic Bible, and that book is a book I can go for 100%. And uh, it explains two-thirds of the book is pure life philosophy, the last third is about magic, you know, and it's not like people think just all about being evil. It's about accepting both evil and good, prefer preferably uh, 90% good, 10% evil. The Satanic Bible was published by Anton LaVey in 1969. The book itself does not teach you how to worship Satan, Rather, it's a collection of essays, observations, and rituals published by LeVay. And not only is it the central religious text of LeVayan Satanism, it is considered to be the most important document to influence contemporary Satanism to this day. King Diamonds would meet LeVay at some point during the 80s, developing a close friendship and even dated one of his daughters. That experience of meeting LeVay Going to the church and getting certain confirmations meant so much to me, but I didn't need the Satanic Bible to confirm my life philosophy. I already saw things that way before I ever read the book, but it was interesting to see it in writing. 
and then to meet them and see how serious they were about what they were doing. It wasn't just some gimmick for money. I met with LeVay, just him and I, for an hour and a half in the ritual chamber. I told him how I felt and he took his Baphomet symbol off and pressed it into my hand. So it seemed King Diamond had already decided to incorporate this satanistic mentality into his music long before he discovered the satanic bible. The occult theme influence would be introduced to Merciful Fate at a very early stage also when they started to record some of their first demos and were seemingly visited by a supernatural force. We were waiting for the other guys to come by my apartment to listen to our new demo and something really weird happened. There was definitely a presence there that made my glass float in the air. We all saw it. We were not on anything. I'd never done drugs. We weren't even drunk or anything like that. It really blew our minds. From then on, I wanted to learn more about it because if you experience something like that, Either you block it out because you're scared, or you get so fascinated and interested that you dig deeper. And that's what I did. The first official release from the band would clearly reflect this early interest in the occult and supernatural. A self-titled EP released on the 8th of November 1982 would feature four songs, all written by King Diamond and Hank Sherman. A Corpse Without Soul have no fun doomed by the living dead and devil eyes their debut LP would come but a year later Melissa released in October of 1983 via Roadrunner Records it's fair to say that at the time Roadrunner was a fairly new label founded just three years earlier not only did they focus on metal music releasing Metallica's Kill 'Em All in collaboration with Megaforce Records during the same year, but they also released music from Roman Grey, a Canadian dream pop outfit, Black Flag, and even an a cappella group from Toronto called The Nylons. Although Melissa wasn't a commercial success, its unique concept, lyrical content, accompanying album artwork, and the band's overall image would all contribute to what would become a cult-like following amongst their audience. Melissa, recorded in just eight days, would be noted by some critics as one of the first examples of an extreme metal and black metal record. Which is definitely not something it would be labelled as today. Yet it became a heavy influence for metal musicians to come within these genres. Even though Slayer released their debut record later that year, Kerry King cited Melissa as a big influence on their future material. There was definitely a Merciful Fate influence on Hal Awaits. You can tell by the super long songs with 10,000 riff changes. That was definitely a Merciful Fate influence. The album itself was allegedly named after a real human skull King Diamond used to carry on stage when they played live, named Melissa, who in the closing song on the record is portrayed as a witch that had most likely been burned at the stake. Melissa, you were mine. Melissa, you were the light. She was a witch. Why did they take you away? Melissa, you were the queen of the night. Melissa, you were my light. I swear revenge. I swear revenge on the priest. Oh, the priest must die. He must die in the name of Hal. This type of storytelling would become common throughout Merciful Fate's lyrics, as King Diamond would often draw inspiration from his love for horror films and his knowledge of the occult, with some stories dating back to the 1800s. However, some of his lyrics were taken quite literally, helping to secure their legacy as a truly satanic band. Just 30 seconds into this album, these lyrics would have given any parent cause for concern. 
I was born on the cemetery under the sign of the moon, raised from my grave by the dead, and I was made a mercenary, all in the legions of hell, and now I'm king of pain, I'm insane. Black Funeral would be a single released from this record and would be interpreted by some as a song that was an act of Satan worship. Bring the black box to the altar. Now raise your hands and do the sign. Oh, hail Satan. Yes, hail Satan. Lay down your swords, the evil star. However, it would be into the coven that would pique the ears of parents across America. Come, come into my coven and become Lucifer's child. Suck the blood from this unholy knife. Say after me, my soul belongs to Satan. Now, now you're in to my coven. You are Lucifer's child. Into the coven, Lucifer's child. This song in particular would grab the attention of the PMRC. PMRC stood for Parents Music Resource Center, an American committee formed in 1985 by Tipper Gore, wife of then Vice President Al Gore. Media outlets would even refer to this era as the Satanic Panic, with the stated goal of restricting certain music being available to young children and teenagers, music that they deemed to be dangerous or that may influence anti-Christian-like behavior. Other songs targeted by the group were Motley Crue's Bastard, Venom's Possessed, and Judas Priest's Eat Me Alive. However, the only thing this campaign did was tell the youth of America exactly what records they should go and buy. After all, kids generally want to rebel against authority and their parents, and now they had a list of bands to help them do just that. The only difference here was that out of the 15 artists on the PMRC hit list, Merciful Fate were the only ones that actually had Satanists in the band. And this little stunt by the Housewives of Middle America did nothing more than to help secure Merciful Fate's reputation as just that. A real life Satanic metal band. One year prior to the PMRC witch hunt, Merciful Fate would release their highly anticipated second studio album, Don't Break the Oath, in September of 1984. Bigger production, more terrifying album artwork, and once again, King Diamond's passion for Satanism and the occult came shining through. Deny Jesus Christ the Deceiver, our Lord Satan and no other, in the name of Satan, the ruler of earth. Open wide the gates of hell and come forth from the abyss. Diamond once again makes no bones about his loyalty and allegiance to Lucifer clear to all those that would listen. Even during interviews he would publicly state that if God did exist, it was he that was the evil one, not Satan. He even tried to speak to several priests in order to get answers about why God is so evil. Yet they couldn't give him the answers he was looking for. Uh, the devil has never been allowed to speak for himself. Never. He's always been called Satan. Actually means the word means the accuser or the opposite. The accuser, he's never, you know, the Christians never say anything about what Satan is saying. He never says anything. I, I tell you, I just can't believe in a God, in God, because he's that evil. But if he is so all-powerful and almighty, why can't he come down to earth and show himself, show himself to people so that they can see that he's for real and that he's the guy to believe in. Instead, he sits up in his head and goes, <laughs> those people don't believe in me. And when that final day comes, I'm going to be roasted in here. That's not terrifying. That's not evil. I don't know what evil is. So I can't believe in that philosophy. So, whilst King Diamond was without doubt a Satanist, it appears he was actually spreading the message that if you're going to believe in something, 
or worship a deity, make sure your faith isn't misplaced in an evil one to which he thought the Christian god was. However, media outlets did what they do best. They spun a narrative of fear. They labelled King Diamond and his band Merciful Fate as a group of devil worshippers with an agenda to brainwash the youth of America into joining their evil demonic circle, like some sort of nationwide biblical apocalypse, which quite simply was not true. Nevertheless, this still gave them even more free publicity. Sadly though, despite the notoriety and success they were starting to see in such a short space of time, Merciful Fate's hellish flame was about to burn out. On the 12th of April 1985, Merciful Fate would be no more. Guitarist Hank Sherman, who wrote most of the songs with King Diamond, had started to behave in a peculiar way which is saying something considering his singer licked a human skull on stage every night. Hank had started to dress in brightly coloured shorts and casual baggy tops, which didn't exactly fit the image of the band. Not only this, he began to write material that would even terrify King Diamond. He was trying to take the band in a commercial direction with pop music, and Diamond would not stand for it. Mostly due to an unprofessional attitude from certain members of the band, kind of stage clothing. Uh, somebody didn't want to do the interviews and in-stores that I needed to to make a career and uh, dressed up too funny, you know, like short trousers and stuff. It, it didn't fit in with the show. Uh, but most most uh, important was the musical side of the whole thing because the former guitarist Hank Sherman, who used to write most of the songs, yeah. he um, came up with new material which had nothing to do with Mercial Fate at all and he insisted on getting on the next album. It was pure pop music, and I wouldn't put my name to that. King Diamond decided to quit Merciful Fate, and the rest of the band followed, leaving Hank to form a new outfit called Fate that would be classed as a glam rock band. This opportunity, though, would be a blessing in disguise as King Diamond would go on to form the King Diamond Band, taking with him Merciful Fate members Michael Denner on guitar and Timmy Hansen on bass, along with the addition of Mickey D as their drummer and Swedish guitarist Andy LaRock, birth name Anders Alhaga. Mickey D, who is well known for being the long-standing drummer for the one and only Motorhead, would play with King Diamond up until 1989, featuring on four King Diamond studio albums, Fatal Portrait in 1986, the Horror Story concept album Abigail in 1987, Them released in 1988, and Conspiracy, the fourth King Diamond studio album released in 1989. Although Merciful Fate had been banished to the abyss, this is the era where King Diamond would write what many consider to be his masterpiece, Abigail. Others have done concept albums, The Who and many others, but never a horror story like this. I'm pretty sure it's a first, and because at that time it was so new, it was automatically going to have a heavy impact. Abigail was a concept album, and a very unique one at that. Concept albums had indeed been recorded before, such as Alice Cooper's From the Inside, that detailed his stay in a New York sanitarium in 1977 due to his alcoholism. Each of the characters in the songs were based on actual people Cooper met here. Abigail, though, would follow a completely mystical storyline, all from the imagination of King Diamond. Diamond says he wrote most of the story for the album after being woken one night by an unusually violent thunderstorm at his home in Denmark. It's about two young people who are inheriting a mansion, and there's something very weird going on in this mansion. They uh, see some ghosts uh, who tell them weird stories, and uh, you hear about what happened in this mansion a long time ago, and all these events sort of happen again. The story takes place in 1845 and uh, you go back into 1777 at a certain point, but there's so much happening there. 
The story takes place in 1845. A young couple, Miriam Nartius and Jonathan Le Fay, are riding in the back of a horse and carriage on their way to a mansion Le Fay had inherited. Upon the journey, they are stopped by seven horsemen and told to turn back or face the curse that awaits them. After occupying the mansion, Miriam becomes possessed by the spirit of Abigail, who was to be born the illegitimate child of Count de la Fay and his wife after his wife had been unfaithful in 1777. On the seventh day of July 1777, the Count pushed his wife down the stairs and had Abigail mummified. This is when Abigail became a spirit and the curse began. From start to finish, King Diamond's second studio album, Abigail, tells this terrifying and torturous story in great detail, making it one of the most revered concept albums ever produced within the metal genre. A harrowing story that no doubt became the subject of many a nightmare amongst King Diamond fans, and still resonates to this day. So the next time you hear something go bump in the night, ask yourself, is it just a figment of your imagination, or is Abigail coming for your soul? All hail King Diamond and his merciful fate.